And the thing that hurt the most was the fact that I did not want to call home and tell them what I had done. To see my dad's face. Oh, brothers and sisters, my name's Salim Siddiqui. And this is how the story goes. Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum as -salam. <laughs> I told you, you were going to go to jail, right? And there I am, brothers and sisters. I'm on this side of the glass. My father's on that side of the glass. Not like this at all. Not on this side of the, the lens and you're on that side of the lens. My dad's on the other side of the glass. Hello, dad. <laughs> yeah, your son's in jail. What a mess. What a mess. Needless to say, my dad borrows the money from the relatives. Who has 10 grand in cash, 10% of $100,000 bail, or whatever it was? He gets the attorney, I get let out. Go to court. <laughs> My dad finds this Muslim brother, right? <laughs> Big beard, kufi, <laughs> comes into court. Civil rights era brother, right? African American. <laughs> comes to my defense. Day of court. It's months later. By now, my dad and my family is so upset at what I've done. I'm so embarrassed. The trauma of everything. All the other brothers, right, that I have been hanging out with, I tell them the truth about what happened. I tell them, right, what I did. And they're all asking me, what the hell were you thinking? I'm saying, I, I don't know. I don't know. Needless to say, none of the brothers that ever hung out with me, none of the brothers that I ever trained, none of the brothers who ever knew me, ever talked about breaking the law ever again. None of us, right? Months later, I get to my court date. The lawyers got me on deferred adjudication of guilt. We come in, you don't even know what's going on. I don't know anything about the law on this kid. I'm like 20, 21, too old to be charged as a, as a minor, unfortunately. My father's like, you better just do what you're told. <laughs> Steer straight, fly right, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> right? Yes, sir, Captain. <laughs> oh, my God, how embarrassing, a son. The lawyer takes us out of the courtroom, pulls us to the side. He said, listen, you're going to get a deferred adjudication of guilt and you're going to say yes and you're going to take it. What does that mean? He goes, it means you're not going to be found guilty and you're going to have to pay back whatever you, you took and some fines and you're going to have to do probation and it's going to probably be for 10 years. But if you do the probation and if you stay straight and don't get out of trouble, don't get into any trouble. It won't be on your record and there'll be no record of criminality and you won't be a convicted felon. Otherwise, this is breaking and entering theft, felony theft of a, of a, of a habitation and you're going to be a convicted felon. And he says to my dad, listen, they don't have a clue who he is yet or what this is about, and I don't want them to know anything about what this is. So you're going to take the deal, and we're going to get this settled, and we're going to do it now before anybody puts this to do with anything. Because they don't know who he is. My father just nods his head. And I'm watching this happen, brothers and sisters, and I'm thinking, wait, wait, who am I? Do you, what do you mean, who, who am I? I don't, I, I, who, who, you guys know who I am? What do you mean, who, who am I? You're important. And you weren't supposed to screw it up like this by becoming a stupid criminal. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's what you mean?
Oh, Brother Glenn Beck, it's time for you to hear the tale. You see, I wasn't worried about jail. I wasn't embarrassed even about my father because my father's going to forgive me. He's my dad. I'm telling you it because it's embarrassing. But the point I wanted you to hear, Brother Glenn, the point I wanted you to hear, you crazy alcoholic who finds the bottom of a glass. is I have to show up for probation every month, pay a little fine and sit in a room with a bunch of other criminals. Criminals like me, because I'm a criminal. And then I got to go sit to, and listen to some regular government worker ask me how I'm doing and seeing if I'm adjusting to regular society. Oh, brothers and sisters who are Muslims like we, have to deal with listening to some American ask us if we can adjust to society. So humiliating. But that's not the worst part of it, Brother Glenn. The worst part of it is having to stand in a line before leaving <laughs> and waiting in a line with a bunch of dudes with a guy in a uniform. to get to a bathroom. And then you step up there, Brother Glenn, and he hands you a little cup. And then he stands there watching you piss in it. Uh. Oh, Brother Glenn, I'm calling you out. Only those who have reached rock bottom. <laughs> and I'm telling you, Brother Glenn, this isn't the crazy one, this is the other one. And you're going to be so happy if you listen to this, Brother Glenn, from the beginning to the end. I don't have time to go through every single one on the Black Robe Brigade. But, oh, brothers and sisters, this is your sign, and oh, Brother Glenn, I'm telling this story, I'm telling it this way, because I'm admitting wholeheartedly that when I'm standing there pissing in the cup, it is the most humiliating lack of gracefulness, the most ridiculous point where I realize, Brother Glenn, that I have lost my sacred honor and done it to myself. And oh, Brother Glenn, you know as well as I do that if you ever wake up from that drunken stupor moment, if you ever arise out of that humility of a moment like that, whether it's at the end of a cup of alcohol, <laughs> see, we're Muslims, we're not allowed to drink, period, and there's none of us who drink, because we're not allowed to befog our minds, so my child's got to be of a totally different cup, brother, again. <laughs> but, the, but the moment and the feeling, isn't it just the same, brother? I'm not calling you out to say you're different than me. I'm calling you out, Brother Glenn, to say you and I are the same. And you see something, don't you, Glenn? <laughs> this is that message, Brother Glenn, from those who call themselves Muslims, the followers of the Prophet Muhammad. It's going to be weirder than you thought. Brother Glenn Beck, do you know who you are? And it happens month after month after month after month. And I am getting so disgusted with what have, has happened to myself that I can no longer handle the pain and the trauma. There's brothers still wanting to go out and train and I just don't want anything to do with the concept of the fight. I don't want to get into any trouble with the law. I'm now a criminal on probation. I don't want to be involved in anything. And I'm telling some of the brothers who used to hang out with me, you know, none of you guys really want to study and, and go sit with scholars and really learn 
And we're all saying, yeah, but which scholars do you trust? There's scholars, some of them are Saudi, they're funded by the royal family. Then they're from Egypt, they're funded by they're the Muslim Brotherhood or they're, they're the Stooges. Or who do we trust? Everybody's got their own hidden agenda and we're all not willing to be part of the game. And we've seen enough of the craziness and know enough of the con that all of us are like, yeah, we don't want to get involved in any of this. And so we've got to be totally independent from anybody. An independent cell as people would start to think, not connected to anybody. But see, those of us who were first doing this, now the idea of going to other places for me started to get frustrating because where was there to go? Some of the brothers were still thinking of going to Bosnia again. Some of them did go Chechnya, Albania. There were places, but I had gotten into trouble with the law and I was getting desperate. Either I better find a way out or do something and I couldn't take it anymore, brothers and sisters. I was losing my mind. I'm still involved in this business and now my dad's got me settled down. I'm in trouble with the law and I'm getting desperate. I'm so desperate that I want to run away. And I'm telling my dad I can't take it. It's a year, year and a half in. I'm here in the States. It's 1993. The World Trade Center bombs go off. World Trade Center. Not 9-11, brothers and sisters. World Trade Center the first time. And those of us who are warning other people and telling them, see, something like this was happening. We told you guys, be very careful. This looks like a total con job. This looks like a total false flag. And if you guys don't be careful, they're going to start hustling you and conning you into con jobs and picking you up and getting you together. And Denzel Washington comes out with a siege and everybody's freaking out. And you know Bruce Willis is coming in with the tanks and oh my God, it's going to go crazy. You're going to find yourselves in orange jumpsuits, man. You guys got to be a little bit more focused and let's stay away from being involved with anything that has to do with anything political because we're not at war with America. But God, I want to leave because I don't want to be in America. This is crazy. Who wants to live here? This is total insanity. There's got to be somewhere to go and I'm still young. I'm still confused. I don't know what to do. And where do I even go? I'm on probation. What am I going to stay? Stuck here for 10 years? I got to find out what's really going on. I'm telling my dad that's it. I'm getting desperate. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to fly and get away. Well, where are you going to go? If you go to any of the Middle Eastern countries, they're pretty much all working with the U.S. government. You'll be a wanted felon. They'll just pick you up. Not if I went to Pakistan. I could go to Pakistan. They wouldn't come and find me in Pakistan. They wouldn't bother. Not for an escape, breaking and entering. They wouldn't even care. My dad's like, you're crazy. I don't even want to tell him that I want to do this. But he knows I'm getting desperate. And if, I, if something doesn't happen... I'm going to lose it. You see, I had been in Egypt, and after Egypt, I'd gone to Saudi Arabia and gone and taken a visit again. I'd already performed the Hajj at a young age with my parents, and now I'd gone to Bosnia, and I was still edging. I was still jonesing. I needed something else. I needed a fix. I needed to go find something. I needed to look for something. And so my dad doesn't want me to just run to Pakistan and go to the tribal areas and just go, oh, gorilla. You know, the monkey bars, right? The Mujahid trip. My dad's like, well, why don't we find out if I can get you into the Islamic University and you go to Pakistan, you go to the university or go actually study properly. Why don't you study? Go to Pakistan. Maybe you could study. My dad always wants me to study the law. You know, you study the law. In Pakistan, they have a program. I think it's like Islamic law and Sharia, the Islamic law, and the, the, the canon law, you know, the, the British law the common law mixed together. Uh, you can do a joint degree and that way you're, you're qualified in both places, you know, it's a, it's a good idea. He's trying to figure out some way to half-half it for me because I'm like, you know, uh, I'm like, uh. So he makes this, this arrangement, he calls this Sheikh from Al-Azhar who knows somebody's got some juice, who's a dean with the uh, 
Pakistan and they 